Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast, the podcast that bridges wisdom from generation to generation. And I'm your host, Coach Furtado. In our episode today, we interview the one and only Dr. Amber Selkin, founder of Selkin Performance, sports psychologist, PhD, an author, and a speaker. In our conversation today, we have a rich, rich dialogue around leadership, the impact, the influence, who has influenced her. She's worked with some wonderful people and worked with the Notre Dame football team and Coach Kelly. Also talking about the mental game, the upstairs, in between the ears, how to be an effective leader as a coach and impact our athletes, our youth at another level and talking about being specific. It's one of the most inspirational and motivational episodes that we have had backed with science. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hello, Dr. Selking, and welcome to the Bridging Impact Podcast. I'm thrilled to have you on today to talk about your book, Winning the Mental Game and Building Championship Mindsets. I believe the coaches and, and young leaders are going to get a lot out of this. So the first question that we always ask our guests, it's, it's a bit of a loaded question, is what is your definition of impactful leadership? Yeah, to me, um, I'm a big John Maxwell person, right? And so Maxwell says that leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. Um, but I'm also a little bit of a nerd. And so, uh, I, you know, influence, I feel like, is a word that we throw around a lot. Um, but what does influence actually mean? And so the definition of influence is the ability to have an impact on or to shape the character, behavior, or perspectives of someone or something. And that, to me, is impactful leadership, the ability to shape the development of an individual. Now, the reality of it is um, there can be positive influence and negative influence. And so right. the impactful leadership hopefully is positive, impactful leadership, where again, you're shaping the character, the development, the perspectives of another individual. And, um, and to me, that's what great leadership is all about. Yeah, I love that. And it's all about, you know, shaping and impacting that person. So then they can go and shape and impact another person and create that domino and ripple effect of leadership. So with that being said, I know that your backstory is, you know, you were in athletics and now you are working in athletics still to this day around along the mental side of things. And I'm curious where I just share with the listeners and myself a little bit more about your story and how you kind of have came to where you are right now in this moment. Yeah, you know, I think the other thing about leadership that I think is really important that I learned um, in undergrad was, you know, when a leader leaves is what they were a part of or the system they created, does it sustain or does it go away with them? And, mm -hmm. and so I share that to say like, one, I think that's another piece of impactful leadership that is important to consider is do we actually build a system that influences other people that is sustainable once we leave it? I think that's a, that's a mark of a, of a great leader. And I share that because um, that to me is what's really important about the mental game. I, I want people to grow in their mental game and understand the power of their mind that they have to impact their own lives and those around them. But I don't want that to be dependent on me, right? I, I want mm -hmm. them to recognize that they, you know, with a little bit of knowledge, with a little bit of education and equipping and empowering, people really come to understand their own ability to lead their personal, the, lead themselves well through life. And, and again, that goes back to, to my own story, right? As a soccer player and um, played at Notre Dame uh, my freshman year, we were undefeated and uh, lost against North Carolina by one goal in the national championship game. And, um, and then I got cut from the team. I had tore both my ACLs. And so I was redshirted for half the year and uh, my knees just didn't come back the way the coaches wanted them to. And I went through this identity crisis. You know, if I'm not Amber, the soccer player, who am I? And, you know, the, the crazy thing is, is I had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I had a family at home that loves me. And I was at the University of Notre Dame, like fairly certain my life is going to be OK, you know, but right. I still had this crisis. And, and I think that that's really what got me into, I led Notre Dame Christian athletes as, as an undergrad student. And that was what got me like, I, I poured so much into it. And then all of a sudden I was a senior and I was like, 
wow, I'm about to leave and nobody else is doing anything but me. So that's what really like taught me how to build a leadership team and create a system that's sustainable. And so NDCA exists to this day at ND, which is pretty awesome. Um, But that was really my first foray into leadership and understanding the importance of leadership and, um, and also the reason that ultimately got me into the field of sports psychology, because I knew, you know, I was blessed to be raised with a family that helped train my mental game that had, I had some tools to go to when I was in a really dark and hard season of life. And I wanted to be able to equip other athletes and professionals um, with those same things to navigate hard times in life because that's real. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely real. And it's one of the things that I personally love about sports and so many of us do, whether we're athletes, coaches, or probably some of both, right? We both have, we've worn both identities and there's so much we can learn from sports, but so much of sports is mental and so much of life is mental and i'd love to you know ex- start exploring some of your work and your research um about sports psychology and the mental game and with that can you talk about how our the the science behind how our thoughts affect our behaviors yeah absolutely i think that y- you know the, the sad part is we don't teach brain school, brain science in preschool, no. which I think we should. <laughs> right. I feel like if people learned how to think right and to use their brains at a young age, we'd have a lot um, stronger, healthier, influential people in the world. Um, but the reason we don't is because we can't see it, right? I mean, we can see mm. our waistline. We can see our 40 time getting faster. We can see our biceps getting bigger, right? We can see um, our ability to, to increase our math scores, right? I- increase. But it's we can't see our brain necessarily being able to focus better and being being able to to be more confident. And so we tend to not manage it, even though it is fundamentally one of the most important drivers of our success. And so what I try to do through my work is teach people some of the science behind brain science and how their brain works and how it impacts how they show up and really realize how important it is to manage our thoughts and our thought life. Because what we know is that our thoughts affect our emotions. Our emotions affect our physiological response. And physio just means body, right? So this is things like your heart rate, your muscle tension, your visual field, your hormones, and ultimately how our bodies are determine our performance or how we show up in the moment. Um, And so thoughts start that process. And the beautiful thing is we get to choose and control our thoughts. So as many uncontrollables as there are out in the world, the number one driver of how we show up moment by moment in our lives is in fact in our control and it's how we think and what we choose to think about and how we choose to think about different situations or scenarios that we encounter. So I'm guessing that you've got a quite a bit of pushback around like, Dr. Selke, I can choose my thoughts, right? Cause we have so many thoughts that come to us throughout the day. So I'm, I'd love for you to unpack a little bit more about how we can choose and control our thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, the reality of it is we can't control which thoughts try to come into our head. We've all been driving down the road on a beautiful sunny day and some random thought comes out of nowhere and we're like, where in the hell did that come from? Right. Um, But we do get to choose and control what we do with those thoughts once we become aware of them. And so in the book, as you know, play number one in this play, this foundational mental playbook is awareness because we have to be aware before we enhance. And humans have Mm -hmm. about 70 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And most people are just very unaware of the thoughts that they're having that are streaming through their brain that are creating emotions that are creating physiological responses like increased heart rate and muscle tension and in increased cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And so it's really an art of awareness to raise our awareness of what are the thoughts that I'm thinking? And are these thoughts helpful to me or hurtful for me? And that's really the part that we get to control. If we recognize that, man, this thought isn't creating a healthy, helpful emotion. Well, then change the thought and and replace that with something different and generate a new emotional reaction. And so, you know, how we're able to do that is that the fact that the brain and the mind are different. Um, The brain is the two to three pound mass that we all have under our skull. And the mind is the spiritual side of being human. And I'm not talking about religion, right? Regardless of what your religious context is, a spirit is what makes a human different than a grasshopper, than a whale, than my beautiful Doberman Pinscher Rockney who's snuggled up beside me right now, you know, like um, that's, and so the, the mind is really what gets to take control of those thoughts and say, Hey, is this helpful? helpful. If not, I'm going to release it and replace it with something different. And if so, then hold on to it. 
Right. And, and I'm imagining as you're talking about this right now, as a coach or, you know, just a leader that's working with youth, your thoughts affect how you treat the, the kids that you're working with or the, your athletes, your team. And so if you're not mindful and aware of that, you are going to either, you know, kind of going back to what your definition you talked about earlier, you're either going to negatively impact or positively impact your team. So I'd love for you to share some stories about how, you know, maybe some of the people that you have worked with have, you know, kind of be like, and, and I kind of remember a few little blips from your book being like, Dr. Stoking, I'm more aware now. And I, you know, I, I can't remember, you know, you have better words than me. So I'd love to, for you to share some stories. Oh, I think the story you're thinking about is, you know, one of our, our college football players, he came up yeah. to me at practice and yeah. he put his arm around me and looked down because these guys are way bigger than me. And, uh, you know, we're, we're on at practice in spring at Notre Dame and he, he comes up and he's like, Doc, I've never thought so much about what I've been thinking about, you know? And so right. he just started being aware of all the thoughts and how, man, a large percentage of my thoughts in the day are not productive thinking. Right. And so he was able to really start to, to reshape how he thinks. But Justin, I love what you said about how our thoughts about others impact how we treat them, right? I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there, you, you've heard the studies, I'm sure, of teachers that were told that this, this class is an underperforming class. And then they did another class that said, like, these students are gifted. The reality of it is, both of them had the same cognitive ability. And at the end of the year, the teacher who taught the lower performing class had lower performing grades. And the teacher that taught the gifted class had higher performing grades because of how they were taught, of how they were treated. And, you know, as a, my first summer, I've been a, I worked at IMG for two summers as a mental conditioning coach. And I don't know if I didn't get the memo my first summer that this was like a kid summer camp, basically, where we had, 8,000 kids throughout the course of a summer from eight to 18. Cause I was just coming out of corporate America, working with adults is easy. Working with kids is a whole other level. And yeah. uh, I was just exhausted at every day because I was like, Oh my God, everybody sit down, shut up, stop moving. What, is <laughs> you know? Right. Right. And, and it really impacted, like I caught myself thinking about, like I was annoyed with them, you know, and I was like, listen, yeah. this stuff is important. How do you not care about this? And and it was like, it was just very negative thinking towards these kids. And so I really took a step back and I was like, okay, why am I doing this? Why am I even in sports psychology? Why did I start here? And I went back to that conversation around identity, you know, and, and I believe that sports psych is a bridge to helping us understand ourselves better, um, the, the, the man or woman under the jersey. And so then I, I, you know, started teaching. And while the kids would come in, I would just try to look at them and think like, Ooh, I wonder who this little dude is going to be someday. Ooh, I wonder what this little girl like is going to aspire to, or, Ooh, I wonder what the hardest things in these kids' lives are right now. And I just tried to reconnect with my purpose and see them for who they were and who they could become. And man, I'll tell you what, I, I mean, by the end of the summer, I was standing on tables, like doing the Notre Dame kickoff cheer with kids, getting them ready for mental performance session. And like, you know, I had one class, everybody just made up nicknames and we just called each other by, I don't even know these kids' real names. I was like, you know, let's all have code names for class yeah. today, you know? And I had this like 13 year old boy who was too cool for school, but by the end of it, he was like alpha Warhawk, you know? And yeah. You know, it's, it's, I think that you're so right is how we think about people just changes how we bring ourselves to the moment and it can totally transform your life and the, the individual's life that you get to serve as their coach, as their parent, as um, their leader. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I'm, I'm like totally agreeing with everything that you're saying, because I know that when I started working with kids five years ago, I was exactly what you're talking about at the beginning of this summer. Like what in the world, these kids don't listen to anything I'm saying. Like, I'm just going to beat my head against the wall. Like, okay, you're my favorite. You actually listen to me. But like yeah. a lot of the times the kids that don't listen and that push back and the ones that are most challenging, are the ones that need you the most. And totally. I think it, it, it does take a kind of a perspective shift of, okay, these kids are really smart and, they, but why why are they pushing back? A lot of times for me that I that I've realized it's trust issues. Okay, how yeah. can I build trust? Well, if I'm yelling at them every time, if that's my interaction with them every time, of course they're gonna not trust me. Of course they're gonna start pushing back. So you know you have to start like thinking in different ways and you know interacting with them 
and as they're human, right? Because you talk totally. about the the man or the woman under the jersey. It was, uh, I was, we had a group of like 150 tennis players and they were all ages, like little kids to, to like 15 year olds. Right. And the 15 year old boys, of course, are like at that, like way too cool for school stage, um, or silly stage. So they'd be in the back of the room, like being silly for the whole session and like very disruptive and, you know, and, and, but, but what do they want? They want to be a part of something. They want to have a job. And, and, and so, you know, I took this group of boys and when they first came in, I was like, listen, guys these little kids, like they're all over the place. And so I need you guys to like, help me manage this class. And like, I want you guys to sit like two rows behind the end and you're going to be my sentinel wall. So nobody's allowed to sit behind you guys, but you're going to be like my back row, the dudes that need mm. to be like locked in. And if people start going crazy, like if you could just help me, we're going to be respectful, but like everybody looks up to you and I'm going to need your help. And the, you would have thought, I asked them to like play on the national team and they were just on it and they helped the little kids and they like, no, 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 we, everybody needs to sit up front. And so it's like, man, I've just found like when you can give people a job and take their thing that they want, you know, want to do for wrong, but figure out how to apply that energy towards good. And then when you name it something like a sentinel wall, now all of a sudden they were a part of something and they had a name for it. And I just think it's so fun to create that for, for, for kids. Kids are cool. Cause like they actually get excited about stuff. Adults are a little lame cause they're like, wah, wah, but they secretly yeah. inside, like also want that. So it's, right. uh, it's, it's, it's fun. No. And I think you bring up a really good point about being specific too, because sometimes they're like, you know, you need to be a role model for the younger kids. Honestly, sometimes they don't even know what that means, to be honest. But you were like, a sentinel wall, this is how, how you interact with the kids. And they're like, okay, yeah, we got it. We got you, coach. Um, yeah. So that is kind of like leads me to the next thing that I'm talking about, what I want to talk about, which is about like motivation and just confidence. Because that's a that's a big thing in sports, right? Like, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, you have, if you have two similar, right, uh, skill levels, the person that is probably more confident in their abilities will win out. Totally. And, you know, in the book, we talk about the five keys to confidence and how, like, what actually goes into confidence. I think a lot of times people are like, I'm playing well, I'm confident. I'm not playing well, I'm not confident. I'm playing well, yeah. I'm confident. And it's just this emotional roller coaster. Or, you know, some kids are just wired more confident or less confident based on how 100%. sensitive they are, you know, and not in a, positive or negative connotation way, just some people just, are more sensitive. And so they process things differently. And, and so you can read that in the book and, and we can build that in kids, which I think is helpful. Um, but then as a coach, like once we teach people keys to confidence, then, you know, we said our thoughts affect our emotions, which affect our body's response, which drive performance. I think as leaders and coaches, we need to understand that our kids often get their thoughts from us. Right. And so in these moments, um, when kids are not feeling confident, instead of just saying like, come on, man, be confident, you know, you you can do this. Maybe asking questions like, well, why aren't you confident? And then, and then when they say, well, cause I'm smaller. Okay. But guess what? That is such a gift. Like I was a little soccer player, right? I was a center midfielder and as five, three, that's not big for a center midfielder. But what I figured out was one, my base, my center of gravity is a lot lower and, mm -hmm. and which means in my, and I have strong legs. And so when I can get low and get right. a good base, I can go up against somebody because, because they'll just go over my top and get a yellow card for jumping over top of me. Right. And so it's right. like, if you can hear what's actually going on in a, in an athlete's mind and then give them different ways of thinking about that, mm -hmm. often it can lead them to a greater sense of confidence and purpose and belief in, you know, however their little bodies are created and however and I say little bodies. I mean, I deal with like 350 pound men every day that are like, you know, I still say like my little guys and, um, they're really big right. boys. And, um, and so it's, it's all of us. It's not just little kids. It's, it's, it's all athletes. It's all adults. And I think asking questions as a leader to really understand what's going on in your athlete or your employee's mind is a really helpful way, um, to speak truth to them and help them, um, you know, think better and, and therefore impact their confidence. 
Yeah, I know that was a big shift for me was asking questions. And this was, I, I made this realization when I was just working with young kids that weren't even in, you know, sports, but talking about like behavior issues and, you know, different things like asking me, like, why did you do that? A lot of times instead of telling them, don't do that because of this, right? They have to like start to formulate their own answers. And I, I feel like if you start asking them questions, it guides their learning process. And like confidence comes from, and, and I believe it's in the book, comes from like, improvement and getting better and seeing yourself get better and seeing yourself get those results. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, now performance is a helpful driver of confidence, right? When you learn yeah. you can do something and you can do it, that totally helps, but we need some other things as well. And so that's a, that's a really great point, Justin. So with that, and we we're kind of building confidence and I'm kind of want to shift over, I guess it's a couple chapters later, technically, but for me, like I'm thinking about when I was an athlete, and, the, and this has been probably one of the more tougher transitions for me from athlete to coaches. I was an emotional player. You talk about probably more sensitive people. I was more sensitive. Like I hated losing. I, you know, I was a little bit probably of the pouty kid when he lost and, you know, and, and it kind of came true uh, through like high school and getting like letting my anger get the best of me. And, you know, a lot of people like are shocked when I tell them because I like come off as like my normal, like casual, like non-athlete self is very like cool and easy going, but I got quite a few technical fouls in my uh, basketball career. And so that kind of translated over with refs in my early coaching career. Um, and yeah. I'm just curious, you know, to learn a little bit more about emotional management. Now, of course, I still need to work on it myself, you know, but like also being able to help athletes and, and younger people just manage their emotions. Yeah. I mean, it all depends on the person, right? There's some people right. that really struggle with actual anger issues. And so working yeah. through some of that and pulling some of that um, out is good and important. Um, and then the other side of it is we're also conditioned when we're little to make a big deal if something goes wrong. Because mm. what happens when a youth athlete is makes a big deal, they miss a goal or they miss a shot and they're like, oh, everybody's like, oh, it's okay, right? He gets attention. And a mm. lot of times they say, oh, um, so-and-so really cares about their sport. They just care so much. You know, that just means you care about it. So you learn when you're little, oh, throwing a fit when things go wrong, that's a learned behavior. Okay. And the, the longer we go in our sport, the less helpful that is. Now all of a sudden the game moves too quickly. You need to reset and refocus and get ready for the next play or else – you're an inning behind and now you're really in a bad spot. And I, sorry, I keep switching between sports of what we're talking no, about. Perfect. I you love it. Baseball and or softball. And, uh, you know, and so I think it's really important to understand that this behavior is no longer helpful for what I want to accomplish or what I'm trying to do right now. So that's one thing. And then with coaches, I always tell them like the number one way humans learn is through the modeling effect. And mm -hmm. <laughs> you are on them about, not losing their head, but then all of a sudden the ref makes a bad call and you're running up and down the sidelines screaming and yelling. So again, the number one way people learn is through the modeling effect. Monkey see, monkey do. And so if you want your athletes to be able to reset and refocus and be emotionally controlled and focus on what's important now and not get distracted by refs or the other team, then you need to model that behavior. And, um, and that's been one of the biggest things, you know, just over the last five years with, with Coach Kelly and seeing his leadership style and how he's been an amazing role model to not only the players, but the coaching staff. Because the bigger your staff gets, the more they're looking to the head coach or to the coordinators on what is acceptable behavior and what is not. Like MF and a kid when they come out of the game, not acceptable, particularly if you say you want to win, right? Quarterback uh, throws an interception or wide receiver drops the pass and a lot of times you see that coaches on them well again thoughts emotions physiological response so they spend time yelling at him and mother effing him and then what happens two plays that are all right here you go little pat on the butt and send them back out there well what have you just done to them mentally and emotionally and physiologically you've totally disrupted their equilibrium it's so that they've not as focused their bodies aren't as loose and they have a higher probability of making a similar or same mistake twice so really understanding how we model behavior and how we communicate on the sidelines um, and how that drives ultimate performance is critical yeah so my my follow-up question with that would be like i definitely understand you know you don't want to berate someone but i i think something that 
I'm someone that's very good. Like my number one uh, Gallup strength is I'm positive and sometimes I miss on the like correction aspect of it. So what do you, what have you seen that like coaches have done or, or that you do that you're able to like correct a behavior or a skill or a performance without degrading that the athlete or the person? So I had the uh, privilege of my, my grad degree is from the university of Missouri. My PhD is from the university of Missouri uh, with Dr. Rick McGuire and my GA position with, was with him in the Missouri Institute for positive coaching. And, um, and, and Dr. McGuire had a phrase demanding, not demeaning. And mm -hmm. being a positive coach does not mean that everything is good and that there aren't expectations as in that there's no accountability. It means that we're demanding. We have very high standards, very clear expectations, um, but we never demean players in the process of that. And so, listen, I need you to get through your progression and execute. You are better than this, but you are not executing tactically. Where are you at mentally? right? Or tell me what you saw in that progression. That is very direct and very clear and demanding. Um, but one, it's not demeaning. And two, you know, it's not all over the place. So I think also question asking is tell me what you saw out there or how'd you get through that progression? Because what that does for us is understanding where are, what are they actually seeing and what are they not seeing? Like it literally might be he made a mistake. Like, I know I was supposed to go here to here and I got stuck because of X. And it's like, okay, cool. Get it fixed. We need you on this next series. Got it, coach. Or he starts talking and you're like, oh God, he has no idea what he's doing out there. <laughs> right. And so right. now all of a sudden it's like, let's simplify the play calling. Let's go back to what we know he knows a hundred percent and position him to be successful as the quarterback. So I think asking questions as a coach allows us to really know where our athletes are at and be able to coach more specifically, you know? Yeah. Meeting, meeting, just like you said, meeting your athletes where you're at instead of, I, I had a great conversation with another podcast guest the other day was talking about uh, like this, this fall will be my first time coaching competitively at high school level for basketball. And I don't want to plan my full like six month practice routine because I don't even know who's going to be on my team. I don't know what they need to work on. I need to ask them questions. I need to visualize and see, right. We have to get to know them. And also like, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how coaches need to learn about how each athlete needs to be motivated or, or learn because we all learn differently or we're all motivated differently. Yeah, totally. Well, first of all, I just want to commend you for even having a practice plan. Like I know so many <laughs> coaches that go into practice, like without a plan. So that's, uh, that's, that's awesome. I mean, and I think too, like, what does that practice plan consist of? What's the plan for physical preparation, technical preparation, tactical preparation, and mental preparation? And are you incorporating all four of those domains in your practice prep, I think is a great way to think about it. Um, and then, you know, I would say that uh, every athlete is different, you know, but, but all athletes want clear expectations and to be held accountable to those. And so, you know, we've got, um, I've had coaches that do a simple questionnaire, like come up with three to five questions that they ask their, their athletes to fill out, to just get to know them better. Like who are the most important people in your life? Um, what's, what's one of your goals athletically and academically? Um, you know, what do you like to do outside of school and your sport? And mm -hmm. so, and then do a one-on-one, -on -one, it could be a 15 minute meeting with each of your athletes just to sort of understand where they're coming from. What's one of the biggest challenges you faced in your life and give them time to write their answers down and then do the one-on-one -on -one meeting. And then I think that really gives you an idea of what you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. We also have, I, I also have a lot of our athletes do simple assessments, you know, on, I mean, we use the five love languages. We use um, the Myers-Briggs and 16personalities.com is like a variation of the Myers-Briggs that is really accessible for our student leaders, you know, as well. I use the Enneagram with players to help them understand just how they're wired. And those are really powerful in, in helping understand how do you communicate and motivate and connect with different kids and in, in different that are wired differently and in different seasons of life. Right. And I also think it kind of goes back to helping them find their awareness because, right, you can't totally. make, you can't enhance without being aware. So it, it's giving them kind of the ownership and, and like understanding of, okay, it's the love languages. Oh, physical touch. So I'm going to make sure I high five them or maybe it's in the last. So maybe I, sometimes I just got to give them a look. I don't need to, you know, high five them or anything else. He's not going to just give me the side eye or, or whatever it is because I, I, I know him now. Right. Yep. So I think that that's a good point with that too. So yeah, uh, my next question 
would be about mental rehearsal. Um, I, I kind of, you know, we talk, you talk about it a little bit differently than visualization. Yeah. You know, we, we talk about mental rehearsal again, different than visualization because visualization I think implies only, um, seeing things in your mind. And what we really challenge our athletes to do is to really bring that to life as almost like a dress rehearsal for a play, right? Making it as real as possible and really incorporating all five senses in that. And so that, that's really why we call it mental rehearsal and, and really trying to activate, um, different neuro pathways in a, in a much, a uh, more powerful way than if we just see something, right? If we add taste and sound and smell um, into a moment, it brings that to life more. And what we know is that mental rehearsal um, actually helps build talent at the neurological level. And so as real as we can make those mental reps, it's almost like we're getting physical reps on the day. So if you take a hundred free throws after practice um, and then you go home and do a hundred more in your mind, well, you've got 200 reps on the day. Um, and your opponent only has a hundred. And so, you know, really adding that into is what, where you can start to see incremental grant, like small, getting that competitive edge and that mental edge. Yeah. And I, I totally think that sometimes like as athletes, we feel like we have to overtrain, overtrain, overtrain kind of the Mamba mentality in like, sometimes some of our bodies just like kind of break down and that's when injuries happen. And like, it's a way that you can get in, like, you know, like you talk about twice the amount of reps in you know half the time half the physical amount of time right obviously it still takes time to do the mental rehearsal can you like give a like a crystal clear example so for a coach like how would a coach use a mental rehearsal for you know let's say a great practice or or a game yeah i mean i think that you have kids shoot free throws after practice and then have them lay down and lay on the court and focus on their breathing and relax their bodies and get in a positive mental state and take you know, imagine themselves in the gym against a rival school with the stands full and, and people screaming and, you know, you, it's, you're standing on the line and there's, you know, you're down by one point. If you make two of these, you win the game and there's three seconds left on the clock and put them in that moment and then have them take a deep Mm -hmm. breath and go through their routine and take the shot and see it going in. So that's a way that you can weave that into like the end of a practice um, and, and, and really create game like scenarios, um, to, to help them prepare in advance for being in high pressure moments. Definitely. And so, but for coaches too, like, is like, have you seen or other coaches use it like before a big game, like they rehearse, like, Oh, this ref's going to make a terrible call. Like I need to, I need to imagine myself or I need to feel myself controlling my emotions. I guess I haven't, I don't have a specific story. I've okay. one of the coaches probably maybe heard that and, and did a rep for themselves. Um, yeah. but I don't have a specific story to share on someone that might've applied it in that way, but I hope they have. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I know I need to do that for, especially for games. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, you never know what the rest are going to call. And I think that's, okay. I, I do just think that's also, it's, it's part of sports though. And that's part of like the beautiful thing about sports is it, and applies to life. Like you don't know, like the, there's so many things that are out of our control. The refs are out of our control, but what, what do we control? How we respond to it, our thoughts to it and how it affects the rest of our play. Absolutely. So you've had the opportunity to work with a lot of brilliant minds, probably in sports and not in sports who, you know, you talked about John Maxwell at the beginning, but who are some of the most influential people to you and your work and your leadership and why? Oh man, so many people. Um, I guess from an author standpoint, like John Maxwell, Erwin McManus is a phenomenal writer that is like one of my favorites. Um, Joyce Meyer is another person I listen to from a podcast standpoint, Rick Warren, a lot of pastors, obviously in that side that I, I listen to. Um, and then, you know, from like an actual mentor standpoint, um, Dr. Rick McGuire is, it has been a huge influencer in my life. We talk probably once a week, you know, he's been around forever. He's seen all different sports systems and, and he's really helped mold me as a professional. Um, and, you know, my mom and my husband are two people that are critical to, to my development. And then, you know, working, working and serving Coach Kelly the last five years has been an amazing journey. And then the leaders that I work with in the organization, um, you know, our CEO, Jason Lippert, our, you know, two of our presidents, Jamie Schnur and Ryan Smith, and then our chief sales officer, Andy Murray. I mean, those four guys are phenomenal leaders. And um, it's just been really fun to watch them grow, to watch them, their strength 
strengths be applied um, and and for them to sharpen me, you know, and how I lead as well. So I think it's just been, you know, all those people that whether I, I listen to or I read them um, or that have been intimate mentors in my life and, 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 uh, guides in my life or colleagues, you know, that I get to work with, um, or serve, uh, have really shaped who I am and how I lead and, um, you know, how that translates to impact in the world. Yeah. And they say that iron sharpens iron. So it's it's so amazing to be around so many great people. I know like at first, I think for me as, as a young leader, I kind of had a little bit of imposter syndrome or like, you know, there's sometimes the ego is like, oh, this person's great. They're getting attention. Like, why am I not getting attention? You no, know, I'm a good coach too. Right. But now, now that, you know, I've had a few years to mature and I still have a long way to go, but I think I'm really realizing that it's, it is amazing to have great mentors and people on your team that like, inspire you and push you to be a better, you know, leader, coach, uh, mentor, author, speaker, whatever it may be. So with that, I'm curious, you know, for kind of our last segment, what is your like, you know, obviously you've been on, on this, you know, sports psychology journey, author journey, right? We's probably a lot of journeys we can talk about, but just for like young coaches and young leaders, like what's your like number one advice for them? And, and like, what mistakes would you have corrected from when you were a younger leader? I'm still young, Justin. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I am young. Um, I, I mean, yeah. No, I, I'm just teasing you. Um, way older than I want to be, but it's fun. I think I'm like mid thirties and it's, it's an awesome season of life. Um, yeah. I think that, I think one thing is just, you got to trust the process, you know, and, and trust the journey. I, um, one of my classmates from Notre Dame, he's working in pro baseball now and just reached out, you know, we've stayed connected loosely through social media. Um, but now, you know, he's a leader in a pro sports organization and reached out to just talk through, um, you know, how they want to position their, their, their leader of their mental performance department and their pro sport organization. And it's really struck me lately. Um, like a lot of, a lot of people that I went to school with or that I interned with now are now like the leaders in organizations. And mm -hmm. when I was a, when I was young and in those spots with them as either students or interns, right. I either saw it as kind of like, this is my competition and I'm going to be better than you. Or mm. I was like, I don't really care about you. I'm going to network with the people that are in the leadership roles at this time. And it never dawned on me once that at some point, these are going to be the leaders in the field someday. And so I think that, I mean, I, I, I think I built good relationships with those people, but it was because you know, we just, we, we just, I'm a, I like people, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, Not like I was yeah. intentional about, Hey, right. we're going to be, we are going to be the leaders in sports someday. Like we should get, we should build relationships and really understand each other and stay connected. And I mean, and, and so we do that naturally because I'm a connector, but like, I was thinking, man, imagine how much more connections I could have with my peers at this point, if I would have thought about that 15 years ago. So I would just encourage you, like as a young leader, as a young coach, look to your right and left and see, and you like, dude, that could be the head coach of Duke basketball someday, or that could be the, the president of the, you know, Minnesota Vikings someday, you know? So like you just never know and, and build those relationships because life is a long journey and there's a lot of work to be done. And so build your network and, and be open with people and, um, sharpen each other because we, we, we need a lot of great coaches and we need a lot of great leaders. There's never going to be, um, not enough opportunity, you know, if you're really good at what you do. And in fact, there'll be more opportunity if you build that network of, you know, strong, close connections that you trust and that you've worked and bled, bled alongside the journey with. Yeah. Connections really are, are everything. And I realized that shortly after I got out of school and I like started telling all my college buddies, I'm like, it's everything like, you know, talk to your professors and, and all these people. And it's just like, at the end of the day, like, it's not to, like you were talking about, it's not to like, be like, oh, we're all going to be leaders one day. But like, at the same time, just being a people person and collaborating and getting to know people, you know, professionally and personally too. It's just, it's, it's kind of fun and it makes the journey more fun too. Honestly, I have a question because you've kind of gone down the, like, like the academic um, side of like sports psychology in, in the sports world. And I'm just curious, like, 
Um, what about sports psychology stood out to you versus like, you know, just going down like the coaching rabbit hole or whatnot? I'm just curious about that. Um, well, you know, if, when I was like in sixth grade, I thought to myself, like, hmm, my ideal life one day would be an author and a speaker. And okay. like, I had no idea what that meant. I just thought that that's what I wanted to do someday, like when yeah. I was 50 and retired. And um, and then I led Notre Dame Christian Athletes. And then I worked in corporate America and realized like, wow, there's a very similar dynamic in sport as there is in business. Like you've, we've all seen athletes that are like so gifted, but like they don't work hard. And so, you know, I, and I was like the opposite, right? I was like, not so gifted, gifted enough, but not get like gifted. Yeah. But I worked my tail off, you know? And so like, I always sort of outkicked my coverage and I just used to think, oh my God, if I had half of your talent, I could be really, really good. And, um, and, and then, you know, I saw the same thing in business, really smart people that just, man, they didn't think right. They didn't, they didn't lead themselves well. And so their careers never grew. And then people that maybe weren't as gifted, but they became the leaders in the organization because they knew how to just win. And, and I wanted to know what is that? And that's when I, I found sports psych and I realized like, holy cow, there's like a whole science behind this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, and I think when I would go hear people speak, I would always leave like, well, that was really motivational, but like, what did you even say? You know? And like, what does that yeah. mean? And it would just seem very shallow to me. And, mm. and so to me, the science is like the depth of this. And when people are like, oh, so you're like a motivational right. speaker. I'm like, no, stab me in the neck. Like I'm not a motivational yeah. speaker, but I do have a lot of energy. So it tends to be motivating. Um, right. but, I, but I teach science, you know, and I want to equip people to live the life that they were created and called to live. And so that's what really drew me to sports psychology. Um, I wanted to know the science. I wanted to have a depth of insight that, um, I could truly help people with. And, um, that would be a d distinguishing, you know, in, in the world of a lot of noise, I think that's out there right now. No, that's beautiful. And I honestly, I share similar, I, I wasn't in sixth grade. I think I was a junior in college when I realized that I kind of wanted to be an author and speaker, John Gordon, who's oh, actually the, probably the first person. Yeah, he's the man. He, I still listen to him and I follow his stuff, but he's the person that kind of got me into this journey of wanting to podcast, create content. And I, I do want to be an author and speaker someday. So this is my last question um, for, for young authors and speakers, because I'm sure some of the coaches and leaders out there that want to do the same thing. What is your advice to them on that as well? I mean, you're doing it, Justin. It's, it's start start, you know, yeah. um, our, our CEO found a quote that he sent around to everybody that was like, think big, start small, but most of our all start. And I think mm -hmm. that's where a lot of people, um, fall down is like, they have these big dreams, but they're afraid to start or they think, well, one day I'll do that. Or, well, I'm not, it's not quite good enough yet. Or they start and like, nobody follows them, you know, for the first three years. And like, that's just how it works. You know, like yeah, and then, it trust is. Me, when you get to year five or year 10, you're going to look back and say, well, thank God, nobody followed me for the first three years. Right. Cause right. Like, it was rough. And, um, and so I think that like doing things hones your craft and it gives you hours under your belt and helps you understand how things work and, and moves that talent from a conscious process to a subconscious process that then frees up space to get better and better and better. And so if you, if you want to be a writer, if you want to be a speaker, if you want to be, um, a coach, like start and, and then let that entrust the process and let that grow over time. Um, excellence takes time and it takes years. And, and a lot of those years are quiet years. And, um, I mean, shoot, if you think of like one of the greatest influencers of all time, regardless of your religious affiliation, think of Jesus. Like he didn't start his public ministry un until he was 30. Like wow. that's a lot of quiet years where yeah. he was just tucked away doing woodworking, you know, or David and Goliath, like, dude, he didn't, David didn't walk out and like, sling <laughs> stone and kill Goliath. Like he was a shepherd out in a field by himself, like killing lions mm. and bears and, you know, you know, challenging himself to see how many times he could hit the same. I could just like see this dude out there, you know, just slinging stones at a tree and, and, and practicing and getting those reps in. And then all of a sudden, like you get your moment. And if you haven't been slinging stones by yourself for a long time, like 
you're not going to hit the giant and you're not going to make history and you're not going to go on to be the king like that. We all got to think like that and, and not think that those are wasted years. Those quiet years are important years. Wow. No, that that's fascinating. And that's, you know, very motivating for me because I always make fun of myself because I I'm getting better at podcasting, but I'm notorious for asking too many questions in one response. So that's something I'm still want to get better. But those quiet years, you mean, I can't have like Instagram moments every day where I have like a million followers all the time, right? Yeah, I have to work quietly in silence. So yeah. I definitely a lot of that resonates and makes sense. And I appreciate your time so much today, uh, Dr. Selking. Final things is like plug, plug your book, plug your resources, and where can people find you and learn more about obviously your book, you and what you do. Yeah. So you can, our website is www.selkingperformance.com and we've got our podcast that you can find there. It's called Building Championship Mindsets. Um, we've got free performance articles. And if you're interested in the book, you can purchase it through my website as well. You can also get it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all those other places. The book is called Winning the Mental Game, the playbook for building championship mindsets. Um, and then we're on all the social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn. Um, but my handles are at champ mindsets. That's mindsets with an S and I'm on team follow back. So look forward to seeing you on social and, and hearing what all of you think about this concept of thoughts and mindsets and winning the mental game. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Selking. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for listening to this episode of the bridging impact podcast. We'd love it. If you would like subscribe, leave a comment and a review on whatever platform you're on. It's the best way to help us grow. We appreciate you for doing that. We'll shout you out on social media. I'd also love if you connected with me on social media. Let me know your thoughts. And this is why I do it. I want to share knowledge and wisdom from experienced leaders to people like yourself and myself so we can have this dialogue and move forward, make an impact on the world. So stay tuned, stay subscribed, Cheers.